Hey everybody, it looks like the connection's working. Today I am live uh, from the car and it's probably been quite a while since you've seen me do a video here, but don't worry, I'm not driving, I'm not moving, I'm parked um, and the car's turned off. But today we're going to dive into Exodus chapter 32 and we're going to see the stage being set for the golden calf. Now Moses is up on the mountain. Bear that in mind, and the people are getting weary. So let's read these first 10 verses, and then I think there's some very applicatory uh, lessons for us to see in our own lives. So let's look at these verses from the Word of God. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off the earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Then they rose early on the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said to Moses, Go, get down. For your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf, and worshipped it, and sacrificed to it, and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, and let my wrath burn hot against them, that I may consume them, and I will make of you a great nation." Now, I know we're kind of leaving on a cliffhanger there in verse 10. We're going to see more of that, Lord willing, up ahead later this week. But we see several things in chapter 32. The first thing, did you notice in the first verse there? In verse 1, the people are not happy because Moses has delayed coming down from the mountain. Brothers and sisters, hear me when I say this. Delay is not denial. God's delay is not necessarily his denial. What did they do when there was a delay? The people fashioned their own God in their own image. Now we may claim that we've never done that, but really get honest with yourself. Have you prayed your own desires rather than God's will as revealed in his word? Have you judged others by their actions, but yourself by your intentions? If we have then we've set up God to be in our own image rather than according to the truth of His Scripture. We're just as guilty. There was a delay, and they took that as a denial, and so they fashioned their own God in their own image. They built an altar, and they sacrificed. They gave to this new deity, this new entity, this new God they had fashioned. Your God may be your career. Your God may be your education. Your God may even be your family. Perhaps you idolize your kids or your spouse. Anything that we sacrifice our time, our resources, our affection and attention for is what we serve. Now, don't misunderstand me. It's good and proper to serve your spouse. It's good and proper to love your children and to discipline them and raise them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. It is good and proper to provide for yourself and for your family. But when we give our attention and we labor for these things, they become what we're laboring for. It becomes our idol. As the Sermon on the Mount tells us in Matthew, we cannot serve God and mammon. And mammon literally was a god of materialism. Not just money, but of materialism back in those days. How often do we live that same way today? Not only that, did you notice that the people, after they sacrificed, they sat down and they ate and they drank? 
They were complacent. They stuffed themselves when they would offer sacrifices in those days. They didn't just offer them to the god or, or goddess or even the sacrifices that they offered underneath the Mosaic Covenant. They got to keep a portion for their own feasting. They sit down, they eat, they drink, and then they rose up to play. Now, in context, I believe we're going to see later on in Scripture that this very clearly has sexual overtones. But think about that. I think there's even a less graphic way that we live this out in our life. We like to stay complacent, stuffed in what we enjoy, our own endeavors to serve our own gods. Enjoy the fruits of our labor, stuff ourselves, overindulge excessively, gluttony, which can be in many different forms other than food. And then we rise up to play. It reminds me how often we become focused on entertainment rather than serving the Lord. Now, don't get me wrong. Some entertainment's not bad. I believe it's a gift from the Lord. But how many people do you know that entertain themselves? Can I get a witness that binge-watching is not something that just everybody else has done? I've binge-watched a TV series I enjoyed before. I would dare say you probably know what I mean. Maybe you had a marathon of your favorite movies for like an entire day. Is this good? Is this healthy? Or is it in a way, rising up to play, rather than experiencing rest from the Lord, completely just vegging out for an extended period of time. Sometimes I do believe vegging out for a short period of time is a gift from God. But when it becomes excessive, when it goes beyond the bounds of the Lord's gift, then it becomes an idol, then it becomes sinful. We then see that the people are wayward. They turn waywardly. Moses is told by the Lord, the people have gone astray. They've corrupted themselves. I'm reminded of the old hymn that says, Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. The people became hard-hearted. They were stiff-necked, the Bible says. They were stubborn. The majority decided what they wanted to do. They had their majority vote. They called their business meeting and they chose to follow Satan rather than God. They were stubborn and that led to verse 10 which resulted in God's holy anger. Just anger, holy anger, righteous anger. And that would lead to Moses being sent down the mountain to confront the sin. God's man, hear this very carefully brothers and sisters, God's man was called to confront the sin of his people with the truth of God's word. This is something we see all throughout the prophets in the Old Testament. Why were they hated by the people? Why were they even murdered and killed by the people at times? Because they proclaimed the truth boldly of God's word in the midst of a generation that didn't want to hear it, that was comfortable and complacent in their own sin. They didn't want to hear the truth. It exposed them and it made them uncomfortable. John the Baptist did the same thing. He confronted politics with the Word of God and he lost his head because of it. Brothers and sisters, prophecy in the Scripture based in, on 1 Corinthians is one of the greatest, if not the greatest, spiritual gift the Lord can give. Prophecy is not about all predicting the future. It's primarily about telling forth, proclaiming the Word of God. So as we close today, let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to give us that boldness to proclaim the truth regardless of the cost for the glory of the Lord. Moses did not enjoy what he was going to do. We're going to see that he got quite angry himself. But brothers and sisters, remember, God's holy anger against sin is completely right. When man chooses their stubbornness over obedience to God, they are in the wrong and they are in sin. And how often do God's people still do that as wayward children? Lord, I thank you for your word, and I pray that you would give us boldness. Father, that you would give us the gift of prophecy, that we would proclaim boldly your truth, O Lord. Lord, give us this gift. Show us, Father, if there is idolatry in our hearts. Father, lead us to repentance, which you send in your kindness. Cause us to sorrow over our sin, that we may receive your grace and your mercy. 
and that we may be conformed to the image of Christ rather than conformed to an image which we have fashioned in our own likeness. In Jesus' name, amen.